many of you are here for John's talk before mine? I got a lot out of that. Passion, attitude, punctuality, effort. I mean, when he was done, I ran right up to my room and put on a pair of underwear. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so if I look different, that's why. I wanted to feel different today. <laughs> so th this is something that I don't really feel like it's controversial. Some of you might take it that way. And if you, if you do, I won't be offended if, if you leave. If you want to argue, you can argue with somebody else. And I'm going to put a little disclaimer in here. What I'm presenting today is anecdotal. I have, I have not put forth the effort to prove this statistically. So I'm, I'm, I'm showing you my opinion, and I'm going to do my best to back up my, my opinion anatomically. And, and so it's something that you can go home and you can think about. You can either say he's nuts, or maybe he's onto something that we can look a little further at it later. So static versus dynamic, and this I'm going to look at today mainly through the scope of medial lateral balance. We don't have time to fit in everything in this talk, and, and I've been around these conventions long enough where if you have three or four farriers together and you start talking about balance, there's like seven different opinions and it turns into a middle school food fight by the end of the thing, right? We all see it just a little bit differently. I feel like we need to let the horses tell us what they want for balance. So static is, the simplest definition is the lack of movement. And dynamic, that characterizes a change or activity. So that's a process. Dynamic basically means movement. I know we're all working on a lot of these horses lately, aren't we? I don't know why you found her. So, why would we shoot for one versus the other? And I think we have to ask ourselves some questions if we're going to do that. Number one, when would repetitive strain injuries occur? Do they happen when the horse is static or dynamic? Do they happen when he moves or when he stands? Number two, which would cause catastrophic injury? I mean, unless a horse is standing still and gets kicked by another horse, if that horse suffers a catastrophic injury, it's usually when he's moving. And that includes sticking his foot through a fence. And then what causes greater distortion of the hoof capsule? So I realized that while a horse is only standing statically, that there may be some distortion of the hoof capsule that occurs. But I think the greater distortion of the hoof capsule is going to occur while he's moving, while he's in a dynamic dynamic motion. So then we'd have to start asking ourselves, what is balance? These are two of my good friends here. And that would be the even distribution of weight. And so I've been thinking a lot about this, right? So this, we're, we're, we're picturing, you know, this Dusty was, it's hard to unsee Dusty in tights, but it's, I'm sorry I had to do that to you. Uh, but we, we, we don't picture the, the foot really standing on a tightrope, right? We don't, we don't think of the foot actually falling over, but I think the foot does. When there's unequal forces coming down into the foot, we see it start to distort to one direction or the other because there's no longer balance coming down the center of it. So that's why I'm tying this together with this, this kind of balance. So then how do we start to see mediolateral balance these are different techniques that have been passed around our industry for a while. The T-square method, lining up the, the long end of the T-square to the cannon bone, trimming your heels perpendicular to the T-square. Radiographically, we look at, that would, would be a lateral, I'm, I'm sorry, dorsal palmar view, so that's looking front to back. And then veterinarians will oftentimes look at those joint spaces or the level of the coffin bone and say, you need to trim a little more off of this side or trim a little more off of the other side. And then the far picture there on your right is holding, we're all told to hold that leg so that it's in that neutral position under the horse and then trim the heels perpendicular 
to the long axis. And then, then there's sometimes an argument, do we trim to the long axis being the cannon bone or the short axis being below the fetlock? Uh, so those are three kind of common ways that we're looking at it. This is one of the issues that I have with, with using x-rays. Um, this is a little experiment. I think some of you have seen this before. These have been floating around for a while, and I've used them in other lectures. But uh, what we have to keep in mind with x-rays is it's a fraction of a second in time while the horse is standing statically. If you have two people shoot the same view, you can get two very different, drastic, drastically different results. And then this just demonstrates that even just the bend of that horse's head changes how we would interpret balance in those x-rays. So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. How many of you were shooting horses before digital x-rays came around? So I think most of us that were remember that when the vet came out and shot x-rays, they were really only looking for pathology. Maybe we looked at soul depth or different things like that, but we were mainly looking for pathology. And then when the digital x-rays came out, then it wasn't long before we started getting new programs where we could measure angles and we could draw arrows and make notes. And, and then all of a sudden, that was when it started kind of crossing over into our realm of balance and shooting. Um, so it's a fairly new development, you know, new being in the past 10, 15 years that these were coming around. So we have veterinarians that, you know, and, I, and I'm not picking on, on veterinarians. If there's two things I hate, it's racism and veterinarians. But, and that, that's a joke if there's any vets here. To, uh, but, but we have these veterinarians looking at these x-rays sometimes six weeks after we've been there to shoot a horse. So the horse has already grown past any sort of balance that we might put them in in that six week period. It's no longer even close to where we had them when we trimmed them or we shot them. And, and then we get the x-rays sent to us from the vet with some little arrows and notes critiquing our shoe job and this is often how we take it, right? It's like, that's how I feel a lot of times when I get them sent to me. Uh, and I'm sorry, I also sent this one to Megan too, that's why she's giggling up here, but uh, it's frustrating, isn't it? And I think the, the biggest thing that we need to keep in mind if we're going to start trying to evaluate balance with horses is that they don't walk on these x-rays, they walk on their feet. And, and so we as farriers need to spend a little more time looking at their feet. It's not that x-rays are not useful, they're very useful, we can see soul depth, we can see maybe some changes in the coffin bone. There's lots of useful information that we can get from x-rays, but I think we need to stop being so hard on ourselves or throwing ourselves under the bus when we don't quite see the results in the bony column we want while that horse is standing in that static position. So then the, the question becomes, how do we start seeing that medial lateral balance while things are, are under load or during movement? This is just one horse that I want to show you, so we kind of use it as an example. That x-ray on the far, see I gotta get this sword, that's your left. That is that horse's left front leg. Did I say that right? Yep, that's that horse's left front leg. That x that picture on the far right is that horse's limb being hung underneath it. So if I were to look at that x-ray in order to critique my trim, medial lateral balance in my trim, I would say I did a good job. There's no major, dis major discrepancies or changes between joint spaces. So we'd be looking at, at the coffin joint, the proximal interphalangeal joint. Those spaces look even. The coffin bone looks pretty level to the ground. And we pat ourselves on the back and say we did, we did good. We, we serviced this horse well. If I hang the leg the way we were often taught to do underneath, I'd look at that and say it's pretty close. If I look down the cannon bell and look down the short path or un underneath the fetlock there, the heels are trimmed pretty perpendicular to that leg. But then when I look at that horse from the front, neither of those methods show me the true angular limb deformities that that horse has in that limb. 
So I can't see the valgus knee in that x-ray. I can't see the inward deviation of the fetlock. And both of those things go away when I leave the leg underneath the horse. So I know I'm going to rock your world a little bit, especially some of you new, new people. But um, this is, I, I did not get a picture of that horse moving. But this is a horse with the exact same angular limb deformity. He in the, actually had the same limb. So on the left front, he's valgus in the knee, and he has an inward deviation of the fetlock. Whoops, didn't, let me get a play here. All right, so look at these feet hit the ground. This is what I'm talking about, a horse not walking on his x-ray. The x-ray told me he ought to hit flat, but he doesn't hit flat. He hits hard on that lateral side. What that's done to the foot is he's actually flipped his feet around totally backwards. So now he's got a right front on the left front, and a left front on the right front. He's got, he's got more of an upright angle on the lateral side of his foot and more of a sloping angle on the medial side of his foot. So, so I think when we get used to looking at feet and understanding how they change from load, a lot of us could look at those feet and already tell you how it's going to land. But these slow motion videos are pretty nice, especially for demonstrating to veterinarians or owners or trainers or different people we work for, because most all of us have an iPhone in our, in our back pocket now. We can shoot these videos real quick and show them. One thing I want you to, to look at, let's watch this one more time. Watch his fetlocks above his feet. Every time that foot hits the ground, watch what the fetlock does. You see a medial to lateral quiver in the limb, right? Just as that foot contacts the ground, you see just this little wobble right there in the fetlock. You can see the feathers on the back of it kind of go shoop, back, back and forth. This is a horse I did at a clinic down in Missouri. And uh, I, they, they told me ahead of time that they had a horse that could probably use, you know, like a spiral shoe job or something like that and asked me what I would need for steel. And I said some 5 8 square would be really handy. And when I got there, they had 5 16 by 3 quarters. So I was bumping most of that. Most of the clinic I was spent bumping up that medial heel. And I still didn't get it bumped enough. I had to build it up some with a with the pad. But I want you to watch this horse go before and after. Same thing with this horse. Take a good look at his fetlocks and the movement when he hits the ground. Now, I, don't, I only shot this horse's right front foot. So focus more on that right front foot if you really want to appreciate the before and after. Same thing as the video we saw before. This horse, I actually see that medial lateral movement almost clear up to the knee. Like that whole leg's kind of wanting to go side to side. What's happening as well is that you see that fetlock fall to the outside heel. Okay, this is the horse after he's been shot. And I, I don't know how many of you noticed that that horse handler, he lands laterally too. <laughs> So when we get this foot landing flat, one of my observations was that that side to side lateral motion has, has gone away. I start to see the fetlock descend more gently and evenly down between the heels. Anybody want to see those either of those again? What's that? Play the after. Do you not trust me? Not at all. No? Anybody see any other observations? I like an interactive talk, so I, I meant to say that before I got started, too. If anybody's got a, a question, feel free to ask it. If you got a comment, same thing. <coughs>
Yeah, so the question was, I did I make a side bone shoe for that foot? Yes. So, and I have some pictures later in here of the shoe that I typically build, and it's not the side bone shoes that many of us built in competitions years ago. It's slightly different. I, I, I don't, I, it's probably would be better referred to as a spiral shoe because in the straight, when my steel is in the straight, it's gonna graduate from one end all the way to the other. But this isn't something, like when we get around to doing this mechanically on horses, you don't have to be a wizard in the forest to do it. You can turn a wedge pad on a diagonal. There's lots of different ways you can achieve it. You can do it with kite shoes too. Fold a uh, heel over and weld it. There's lots of different ways to get it accomplished. Everybody good on that video? All right, so this is another observation that I've made in the before and after. And it's when both of these feet are loaded and on the ground, they're both that foot, both pictures, right? The before and the after. So it was interesting with this horse. I, I didn't get the x-rays for it, and I apologize for that. We didn't take x-rays that day. But when he was standing statically on the ground, it was the same as that horse I showed you before. His joint spacing was correct, and his coffin bone was parallel to the ground. Now what I've done to him is I've changed that, haven't I? Now, I, if we were to go back and shoot an x-ray, we're not gonna see a coffin bone level to the ground. We're possibly going to see some mild impingement of the joints, specifically on the medial side where I raised that foot up. So then, we, you know, every time you have a bright idea, the best thing to do is try it on your wife's horse before you do it on the clients, right? So in my case, my, a lot of my horses have had every harebrained idea I've ever come up with, and it's always better to cripple them than somebody else's. Uh, I haven't seen this make a difference in these horses. I still see them go better in the long run. And so we start having to ask ourselves why, and we're gonna get into that in the middle in a minute here. These horses are tough. How many of you have had to shoe peanut rollers? So I, I did not do a lot of, of uh, quarter horses during my apprenticeship with Dick. And then the entire time I was in Michigan, it was mostly warm bloods and dressage horses. I've always ridden quarter horses, but, but I've only recently be, begun to realize how miserable they are to shoe. <laughs> I miss tall horses, but uh, Western pleasure horses are, are particularly painful to watch, right? We get a ton of them that come in to the clinic, and every one of them looks clean. Even when they're blocked and everybody goes, wow, that looks so much better. I, mean, I, I can't see it. I can't tell. Uh, and then the clients will report back to me, he's going so much better, his nose is even further into the than before uh, and so I don't know I don't often understand why I made a difference in these horses but I can tell I have in some of them these horses are really rough so this horse here we have that outward deviation of the fetlock maybe possibly a slow twist in orientation of our third metacarpal bone cannon bone so there's we see this toed out appearance in this horse so if you watch a lot of horses go that land laterally, you see that slight inward deviation of the fetlock. And so then a lot of times the assumption is if they toe out, they're gonna hit on the medial side or maybe crush their medial heel. And I think sometimes what further perpetuates that notion is that we see uh, a lot of horses like this, this particular horse that came to see me because it had the medial, medial quarter crack on that foot. Uh, but these horses still land laterally, and so they're they're a little bit they're they're a much bigger challenge for us, I think, as farriers to shoe. Uh, this is the horse moving here. Uh, I took one still photo while it was in movement, so you can kind of better see that that hard lateral landing on that left, especially the left front foot. That's where that quarter crack was. And so then you have to start asking yourself, why are we getting the quarter crack there? And can you see the, that little yellow line on the far right? So that's where his fetlock is falling. So this is where we're getting into why horses have to hit flat 
the, the, the importance of addressing these angular limb deformities in our shoe job because there's two forces coming into the foot. There's the force of the ground and the force of the horse. And so that horse's fetlock is falling into the medial heel. The ground is pushing up on the medial heel. And so the medial heel sooner or later is going to give. So this horse would benefit from being shot in that spiral shoe or side bone shoe, probably with a hard bar incorporated into it so that you can still continue to float that heel. But then what would really help them would be a medial extension so that you actually have some material out there carrying the load of that medial heel. The tough part is they step them off in the trailer before they make it to any show, right? So if we could probably use glue, put some glue in there. I'm not like a lot of the other university chewers. If you guys want me to teach you how to glue shoes, I'm not the right guy for that. I pretty much nail everything. The best way I can describe myself gluing a shoe is a monkey humping a football. So that's like, if you want a good good visual of me gluing a shoe on that would be the best description right there. So if we can't cover that crack either. That thing was bleeding, so I don't want to patch that, that crack. This is another horse that has that outward deviation there at the fetlock. What I'm doing in the picture to the right is I'm taking that horse's left front foot and I'm taking it forward under the knee and I'm getting him to relax and just hang that leg underneath him. So I can't figure out why I see that angular limb deformity completely change when we go forward. And I think there's too many variables maybe for us to sort it out from horse to horse. And I've thought a lot about how I would address these clinically or, or through research. And I, I honestly think that I would have to dissect hundreds and hundreds of legs that I was able to see attached to the horse before I got them. Because I don't have enough faith in the radiographs to take true measurements of joint orientation and things like that and get an accurate reading of it. So, but, what's that? I, we have access to MRI and that would be really good. The problem is I don't have funding to do all of those horses through MRI. So that's a good question, but MRI is a great tool and a gold standard, but we don't get the funding through research to do it and very few owners can afford to have it done. But yeah, that, that's, so that explains to me a little bit why we see a lot of those horses that tow out still hit on the lateral side. As you take those legs forward, pull them forward, you see the foot twist even more. I don't know if that's that lateral extension ten, uh, lateral extension tendon in the front leg that, that causes that or does that. I'm not, I haven't quite wrapped my head around that. But, um, but I think that's part of the reason we see that. So I think if you want to evaluate true angular limb deviations of forelimbs, this is the way you should evaluate them on the horse. Pick the leg up and take it forward as well as watching them move. So then how do we start to achieve medial lateral balance or try to determine it in our trim? I think we just need to let the heels tell us where they want to be trimmed to. So these, these pictures right here are just holding a ruler up to that inside of the heel along the frog and looking for that first bend that you find in the heel. So it's on some horses it's very, very slight, but it's always there. And I find that sometimes even when I can't see it with my eyes, I can feel it with my thumb. So I run my hand down there, I can feel that little bit of a bend. And I want to trim that foot just slightly below it. Give him a few weeks to grow back to where he started to distort his heel. Then he's got another couple of weeks or three weeks to grow beyond that point, and then we bring him right back to balance again. This next slide is a horse where this is really drastic, but this is a good example of what we're seeing here, right? So that that would be the lateral heel there on the left side of the picture. It bends to the medial side, and the medial heel also bends to the medial side. So they distort in the same direction. Both of them start to bend or distort at different levels. So that's our ground force and our horse force coming in and starting to tell us where that particular horse, where, where he wants his feet trimmed to. 
I'm not doing on time, I don't know. I've got a thumbs up. Whoops. Oh yeah, I wanted to show it from the side. So that picture on the right, that's looking from the lateral side of the horse to the medial side. And when you look down the side of that, you see the distortion change in both of those heels. One, one is bending, one is concave, and one is convex. So different loads causing those different changes in the foot. So does it, the question is, does it correlate, the heel bending correlate with the long axis or the short axis? Is that the question? Um, I think it does, but why, I, that's what I can't explain. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I may leave you guys with more questions today than answers. Uh, and, and the feedback will be great when I hear back from you guys. But I, but I think what, why we're seeing that is there's, there's obvious deviations in the limb. And that's causing those heels to change in different directions. Whether it's inward deviation, outward deviation of the fetlock or the knee, that's why we're seeing the change in the foot. Did you have another stupid question? <laughs> you know I love you, Josh. I, I like, you know, we're good, we go way back. So then the question is why do they need to land flat and what do we have to do to get them there? Any, any ideas? Let's make it a discussion. Why? Why would they have to land flat? Takes the strain off the joints. Takes the strain off the joints. Takes the strain off the joints. Yes, minimizes distortion of the hook capsule. Strain off of the joints. Anything else? Soft tissue injuries. Soft tissue injuries. Perfusion. What's that? I can't believe Shock absorption. Shock absorption. I think you guys covered it. That's pretty impressive. This is from Tracy Turner. So you, when you do the math on that 78 pounds per square inch coming into a foot, that's roughly 1,700 pounds per square inch coming into a foot during movement. So, so there's, there's obviously a lot, of, a lot of force that's entering the foot. And, and then what we don't necessarily have a way to calculate is the load of the horse coming into the foot. So like I said, we've got load, load coming into that hoof capsule in two different directions. What, it's, what that hoof capsule is asked to do is, is pretty remarkable. And the fact that it can do it is even more amazing. So, I think we're, we're looking at structures in the foot that are made to dissipate shock. So, so if we, it, it's like they're all put together as a team. So we've got our, our, our frog, our sensitive frog, our digital cushion, collateral cartilages, our venous plexus, that's our basically a hydraulic absorption as that coffin bone is descending and moving forward, gives it a little bit of a rebound heels are moving outward. All of these things work together to dissipate that 1,100, 1,700 pounds, whatever I just said, of that pounds per square inch that's coming into the foot. The problem is when the foot hits hard laterally, none of those engage before that concussion force is going up the limb. So now we've got our distal interphalangeal joint, proximal interphalangeal joint, our fetlock, so on and so forth going up the leg. Once that's hit, the damage is done. Once that foot rolls flat, it's secondary. It's not that it isn't benefiting the foot in some way, but where that horse really needed it was right when that foot came into the ground. And, and it, he didn't have it right then. So that's my hypothesis on why this flat landing is so important. And, and this really hit home for me when I took that job at Iowa State. I mean, I, I do work on a lot of catastrophic stuff that comes in, the leg lacerations, hoof evulsions, all that sort of stuff, but a big number of the horses that we work on are, are the undiagnosed lamenesses 
They, we shoot the x-rays, we don't really see any real remarkable pathologies, but these horses are just always kind of on again, off again. And what I'm finding more often than not is this is one of the issues that these horses have going forward. And especially because I'm in the, the heart of that quarter horse country. So I, some of you that live in different areas with different horses maybe aren't gonna see this to the extent that I do. But this, this is a kind of a neat model. I like to show the vet students there about with that movement of the foot. So if that foot hits hard laterally, that movement's not even gonna really take place the way it's, that we, the way we see it functioning in the video, right? We, we'd actually see a lateral heel being pushed in. And then that fetlock fall into the outside is pushing on a corner again in that area too. So I think that there's, there's kind of a long list of pathologies then that we can start to tie together with these horses that are moving this way. So side bone would be the obvious thing, right? That calcification of the collateral cartilages. One thing that I notice on a lot of these horses with medial lateral imbalance and landing is really deep thrush in the center cell by the frog. And I'm beginning to think that that's opportunistic. When we have those, the back of the foot starting to shear, the thrush is the secondary thing. So these are actually, I think, shear heels that we sometimes misdiagnose as this very deep thrush in the center cell guy. But also look at the bar on the side of that foot too. That'd be the foot right there in the middle. If you look at the bar on the medial side as opposed to the lateral side, I'm sorry, the lateral side as opposed to the medial side, see that big bend in the bar. The bars show you a lot of distortion in the foot. Don't forget the bars. The bars in the corner, man, are two things that I think oftentimes barriers overlook. And those oftentimes are one of the first things to start showing us that major distortion in the foot before it completely goes wry on us. So then we'd have high and low ring bone, and then in that top right-hand corner, synoviitis. And this is something that I do see correlate with our MRI horses. So it, it oftentimes is a secondary finding that the radiologist will write in their report. So we'll send horses through the tube that we've diagnosed with caudal heel pain. How do all those horses land? Toe, toe first, that toe stabbing motion. So that toe stabbing motion, even though it's different than our medial lateral motion, is also robbing the foot of the shock dissipation because the back half of the foot isn't engaging before the front half strikes the ground, right? So one thing that, as I read these radiology reports on the MRIs, it's interesting how many navicular horses the radiologist will report having coffin joint synoviitis. So that's a fancy way of saying that the coffin joint is pissed off. That they can also tap joints to look at that and then look at the quality of your synovial fluid within the joint. So just interesting secondary finding there. This is the shoe that I put on a lot of those horses, and depending on what the horse does for a living, you can modify the design of this shoe to make it work. A lot of the horses that I'm putting it on are running barrels. That's why I'm fullering them through the toe. I don't think it would matter if you fullered it on, out through the lateral side, but it gets more and more difficult to fuller through that quarter inch deal if you run your, your section down a quarter inch on the outside. So I'll oftentimes just plain stamp that. Dude, 5 8 square is really nice to work with if you have a striker or if you got to really build up a lot on that medial side. But like I said, if you guys don't forge, there's no shame in that. But you can wedge up that lateral heel. Vern's got a question. Do you tend to see a lot of these horses back for repeat or is it one time and all? No, oh, I, I do see a lot of them come back. Um, do you have a follow-up? Okay. Since you see those same horses come back, do you find as that hook capsule starts to settle and be a little happier that you have to knock down the size of that wedge, the height of that wedge, or no? No. 
So the question was, do I see a lot of these horses come back after the first time I apply the shoe? And then as they come back later, does the foot start to settle so that I have to reduce the height of my medial heel? And, I, and I've not been doing that. And I think part of the reason is, is because the, the true problem is further up than the foot. So what I do see is less distortion in the foot, you know, with my, my flares pushing to the, to the medial side or off that medial toe. But I don't, I've not ever had to actually change the height of that or modify that once I get them going flat. The thing is, is that, especially like those two horses I showed you in the beginning of the video, you can't trim those feet into balance. It isn't gonna happen. So don't, don't think that you can start just letting that medial heel grow long because where does it grow as it gets long? It goes, it's going forward, right? So the, the more forward that it grows, the further it's out from underneath your load coming down through the cannon bone, then you're starting to push up the coronary man, and then the next thing you'll be treating as a quarter crap. So trim those heels back to, to good, healthy places like I showed you in the first video. Look at where the heel wants to be, trim it there, and then you're basically putting a, a prosthesis on these horses. Um, yeah, TG. Yes, the question was, do I see? To be able to, because a lot of times your lateral will be higher than your medial. And yeah. it settles down to where it on a current. I, I do. Yeah, so the question was, do I see that medial corner man start to settle down and relax? And, and I do. I, what I'm doing right now is, is like, I'm not preaching from the pulpit as much as I'm talking from the crowd. Because like when I look back at all the horses that I tortured before I started figuring out this process, I can't repent enough. And I was very stubborn about how I was shooting those horses. I had a beautiful perimeter fit. I had clips burned in. It was like, this is how this horse needs to be shot. And it's your fault if he's not going right. And if you don't like it, find another farrier. And, and so that's a lot of what I see coming into Iowa State. These horses are shot well. Nice high nails, nice fit. They're really somebody's done a lot of a lot of good work in shooting these feet, but they've missed that part of the horse above the foot. I remember not long after I was kind of phasing out my apprenticeship with Dick Becker, start I was really struggling with with a few horses, and Dick was always nice enough to come out and look at them with me. You know, and I'm, I've got these horses shot. I'm trying more and more gimmicks to try to get him to go right and nothing's really working and I have Dick come look at the horse and he turns the corner and he looks at it from 20 feet away and goes look at his knee and then I realized that I never looked any, at anything above that horse's foot <laughs> I've been shooting him for two years and I didn't even know there was a horse above that foot that I was shooting so I know we hear a lot of times from farriers say we don't shoot the whole horse but I when when movement affects the horse we are shooting the whole horse if he can't do his job because of his feet, that's on us in a way, right? I mean, there are certain things we can't change, but there's a lot we can. So, lots of different ways you can build this shoe, whip across bar shoes, jump, jump bar shoes in, heart bars, all different, all different ways you can do it. Uh, but this is, this is a common way that I would do it. So, one of the theories that I used to hear for years, am I still good on time? Yeah, how much more do I have? I got maybe another hour and I'll be done. Time says good. All right, so how many of you ever heard that, you know, we always ask the question, if they hit hard laterally, why did they get side bone on both sides? And one of the answers that I used to hear was that when they hit hard on one side for a while and it becomes painful, the horse then modifies its gait to land on the other side, and that's why they start to develop the side bone on the other side. In all of the horses that I've been observing, I've never seen a horse capable of doing that. They never modify gait going forward. They, they will stand with the foot to the side, to relieve pain, maybe if it's medial or lateral. But once that horse is in motion, he 
it no longer has the, the mechanical ability to modify that and still maintain equilibrium going forward. So this was something that I had to do an unbelievable amount of research to figure out, even my veterinarian colleagues. So what I wanted to, this, this is what we would call, call adduction and abduction, right, in that horse. So as that horse is going forward, if he's going to move one foot out to the side, that would be abduction. If he were to move one foot inside as he's going forward, that would be adduction. So I'm asking my, my colleagues at Iowa State, my surgeon friends, where does this occur in a horse? Which muscles do they use to do that? And they were all kind of like, well, I think it might be here. Uh, but they didn't remember even learning that. So I had to go through lots and lots of books to try to sort this out. And here's a, here's a video. This is where you will actually see, one of these is a video. There you go. This is, if you turn a horse in a really tight circle, that's where you can most appreciate that abduction and adduction of those four limbs. So as he's doing that, he's going to land hard lateral, hard medial, hard lateral, hard medial. He doesn't have a way to change that as you turn him in a tight circle. That's why it's often really useful to, to quickly evaluate a horse in a circle before you shoe him, right? It's a really easy way to see lameness. If they're lame on a foot, they're not going to they're not going to spin on it or cross that other leg over, so you'll see him kind of short step and rob you as you're going to turn around. So the only joint that this can occur from in the forelimb, this adduction and abduction, is, is your, your scapular humeral joint. It's the only ball and socket joint that we have in the forelimb, and it's the only joint that would that is aided by must by musculature to move it in those two directions. So that's clear up in the shoulder of the horse. The leg from there down is going to remain straight. So now you start to understand why if you're trotting this horse forward, he can't modify that one leg. He can't abduct at the last second without falling off into the middle of the circle. So you've got to keep it underneath. So your abduction is, is mostly your deltoids. I, I did figure out that the infraspinatus is, is a component. This is where those two muscles are. That would be your infraspinatus. And these are your deltoids. So that's, that's what's allowing that horse to pull that foot outside. That, that's that abduction would be those two muscles. So then your adduction is mostly your pectorals, major pectorals. Subscapularis, pectoral, subclavius, and then these are where these muscles occur. And this, the circle that you see on the far right, that's the axial skeleton of the horse. So that's that horse's barrel. So these horses are on the inside of, of the um, scapula. That, so the, it's, and it's mostly your pecs that are pulling, the horse's pecs that are pulling. So I, I don't know how many of you find this interesting, but I, it was kind of a fun journey for me to try to figure this out. And it explained a lot to me too, why it kind of, this helped debunk some of those myths that I was hearing. And I think a lot of times we can debunk those things just with a better understanding of anatomy. And, and it's, it is really, you know, I'll go off on a little tangent here, but, but at Iowa State, I, I'm teaching this two week rotation a clinical rotation for fourth year vet students. And I didn't realize till I got there what their level of distal limb anatomy was, what they were taught. They get one hour of distal limb anatomy their first year of vet school. And, and, and I'm amazed at how well they remember it. So if I ask them for origination of tendons and how they course and where they're attached, they usually recall it really well considering it was only an hour three years ago. Um, but when I ask them, how do we unload these tendons? What's, what are the biomechanics of the tendon? That isn't part of their curriculum. And that's really our wheelhouse. That's what we have to know, isn't it? We have to know where load goes, how we affect the limb when we're making major modifications like these side bone shoes. Um, so 
what I'm finding is that because that's not really a part of their curriculum, it's often really hard to find in their books. Even. So it often takes me going through several different books that I'm borrowing from my veterinary friends before I can get some of the answers that I'm looking for like this. Question? That, that's a, he asked if I'm, if I'm looking at front feet and hind feet and if there's a difference in that approach, and there is, and, and I don't even have time to get into the back end, but I'm gonna brush on it really quick because if you try what I do on the front to the back, you're, you're gonna have a train wreck. And so that's why I wanted to throw just a little bit in here on the hind end. But before I do, another thing that's really important for us to, to know is diagnostic tools that veterinarians use to, to diagnose lameness and how we can use those to our advantage. So you guys are all probably familiar with leg with blocks, right? Local anesthetics that we use so that the horse can't feel part of his foot. So if we go up to that fetlock level right there, that's what they would call an abaxial. That's gonna block the whole foot. So it's important, this is where it's really important for us to work together with veterinarians because, because we're pretty intuitive. When we see these horses every six weeks for the last 15 years, oftentimes we have a pretty good idea of where lameness may be coming from. If we just need help maybe localizing it a little bit better, or, um, or confirming what our assumptions might be. So it's important that veterinarians don't skip our palmar digital blocks, which are lower down into the heel. That's that the little blue dot in the very bottom right of the heel bulbs. That is what block would block the bottom of the foot and the heels. That's, that would be what we would do if we wanted to diagnose a horse with caudal heel, heel pain. We would block that. What's interesting is that we can, because there is a medial and a lateral neurovascular bundle, we can block one side of the leg. And so this is where you really have to request this from your veterinarian friends, because it's their habit to just block both sides. So what I'm doing when I see these horses that are landing really hard laterally or medially, and I want to confirm that that's the cause of the lameness, I can ask the veterinarian, block the side that hits. Now that timing now is very important with any block that you do. If it's in too long, it's gonna diffuse and move to other areas. So you have to monitor that. If we only block the lateral side, we need to keep checking that lateral heel. As soon as it's blocked, we need to get the horse out trotting. If we wait too long, there'll be some diffusion to the other side of the foot. But that is a good diagnostic tool that we need to understand and know about. I think those could be our best friends. If, if we find out that veterinarians have skipped some of these and moved down up the leg to a high four point or something like that, we've missed very important diagnostic tools over in the limb. That's sometimes why we maybe have a horse that was diagnosed with laminitis, but we keep seeing this toe first landing. And then when we ask how was this diagnosed, we find out that they jumped to an abaxial and did do their PD first. So, it's important to understand that stuff and work together on it. All right, so I am almost done. I just want to hit on this real quickly so that you guys don't go around the hind end of horses and blame me for it later. It's a completely different animal, all right? So the, the hind leg, we have our reciprocal apparatus. Our pelvis is attached directly to the axial skeleton of the horse via our, our SI joint. So our, our scapula, we have a thoracic sling. The pelvis is, the, is a direct bony attachment. There's no kinetic leg. When that horse moves his foot forward, his body moves forward. The front end is different in that, in that way. The other thing that's very interesting is the difference between our tarsus and, and our carpal, uh, in our tarsus and our carpus. Sorry, I had to figure that one out. So, what, what we have in the hind leg is that tarsal cruel joint, or tibia tarsal joint, which has an outward orientation on a slight turn, which directs that leg 
outward or should direct that leg outward. Doesn't work often with horses, and you guys will figure out why in a minute. Um, so there's, there's, these legs are not going to be angular limb deviations in the hind leg. Hind limb are not going to be as readily influenced by postural adaptation or movement because, especially with our reciprocal apparatus, kind of keeping everything where it needs to be. Am I making sense? Am I get like an amen? All right, good. So, and I'm going to be completely honest with you. The more that I try to learn about the hind end of a horse, the dumber I feel. I can't figure these out. And it's the same with the front end. Like, the more that I dive into trying to figure this stuff out, the more I just end up with more questions that, that I'm having to try to find answers to. So what's interesting here, that foot that you see it be on your left, that is that horse's left hind foot. This horse lands laterally, but his corner band drops to the very opposite direction of that front foot that also hits laterally. So right away, I see, I see a major change in my corner band. If I have a front foot that hits lateral, I see a high corner band on the lateral side. If I have a hind foot that hits lateral, I see a low corner band on the lateral side. So this sounds very counterproductive, but I'm actually building the opposite shoe for the hind leg. I'm, I'm building up my lateral side, thinning out my medial side. And I had this genius of a plan when I came up with this. I was thinking, okay, the, the horses that we really see hit hard laterally are base narrow horses that rope walk. We all know them as shoe pullers. We're at that barn like every other week putting a shoe back on the front, right? And it's because his hind feet don't track outside of his front. They're coming in, he's, he's rope walking, he's nearly brushing his fetlock as he comes through. When his foot hits the ground and he goes through mid stance, the worse they are, you see that outward twist of the hawk. And then we all know those horses are miserable to shoe. Every time you tap a nail, they suck you back under, don't they? They're sore in the hawks. One of my theories is that that tarsal cruel joint's not meant to, to twist. Those joints are not, they're meant to, both, both the carpal and the tarsus are made to, to have some of that medial lateral mild twisting, but not to the extent we see some of those horses do that. And I think that's why we're seeing that hawk pain in those horses. So what I thought I was going to do when I put the shoe on was I was going to turn that toe out, and then I thought if I toe it out, the leg will follow the toe. And boy, was I wrong. I, I got a video showing you how wrong I was. This is just another observation. I'm still trying to figure out how we sight hind feet. But one thing that I do see, besides just looking at the coronary band, is when we look down those legs, we see that that outside heel also wants to be built up. If we, if we just sight it, you see that that foot is turned from the, from the long axis of that leg. So I'm not getting, I'm not trying to tell you how to shoot these hind ones. What I'm trying to tell you is that I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to shoot these hind ends. But this is how I did that horse. I want you to watch him move real quick. This is, just look at his left hind before and after. You see he comes in really close to his other fetlock. <clears throat> kind of comes in towards the diagonal front foot and then lands slightly on the lateral side of the hoof. So then this is with that medial or lateral extension, kind of that wedge lateral extension shoe on. And this didn't come out quite as slow as it was supposed to, but you can still see it. So what I was able to accomplish with the shoe was a wider landing, but it didn't, the swing phase wasn't at all what I expected. And that's what I really can't figure out. So if you watch that swing phase again, this horse still nearly brushes his other fetlock. And it's at the very last second of the swing phase that he pushes that foot out to the side. And I haven't even begun to try to figure out adduction and abduction in the hind limb. I don't, I'm not, don't ask me which muscles do that. 
so I don't know. This this just led to more questions. Is this proprio receptors? Is it you know have I modified the bottom of the foot enough that his brain registers this and he's he's moving it outward underneath? But what I saw that that horse wasn't able to do on the front end, he was doing on the hind end. He's moving it. He appears to be moving it outward on the hind end. This is just a still right as these feet hit the ground. So what I want you to look at here is the width between his fetlocks. So what I'm, what I'm achieving is these feet are going wider. The wider that they go, even if it's at the tail end of that swing phase, they land flat. And then if they're wider as they come back through mid stance, I see a reduction in the twist of the hawk. Now the, what's really driving me crazy is that what I'm doing on the front end is working on that 99 plus percent of horses. When I do this on the hind end, I'm not seeing the success rate there. So I, I see a horse move like this and I think, you know what I'm gonna do, work on the last one. And it work at all the next one. So I'm sorry to disappoint you guys. It probably just confused you just as much as myself, but watch them go in the back. I think the back end of horses is the motor. And we, we often overlook what's going on in the back because we, have, we see more of the lameness in the front. Do you think it has to do with how conditioned they are? How conditioned they are? Yeah, like... That's a good question. Does it have to do with how conditioned they are? It could. I mean, a lot of what I see, though, is these horses <laughs> coming in that are, they're running barrels. They're ridden every day. I mean, they're not. They're not under conditioned by any means, but with our tarsal cruel, which which joint? <coughs> so does it have to do with that having to come back into position? It could. This is. I mean, hopefully, this is what you guys are all going to be talking about in the bar tonight. Maybe you'll get it sorted out and you can tell me all about it in the morning. Hey Doug. Yeah. Have you done these same videos not on concrete on different substrate? Like yes. Would have you notice a difference then or not? Yes. I see on some horses I see actual increase in width in the softer that I don't see on the concrete. The question was have I tried this in different substrates? And yes I have. Uh, I didn't have time to put all the videos in on this horse, but some of the horses I actually like if it works on the concrete, it works in the dirt. Some of them in the softer footing, I'll see track just slightly wider. And, and one thing that you do see in the, in the sand, if that shoe is gonna work, is you stop seeing that rooster tail as that foot's coming in and striking the outside. So, so that's another thing that I think we, we should be looking at when we watch those horses trot. Sometimes we get focused on the head bob. If you have one foot, that's hitting the ground and spraying sand and another that's not, that foot's, that's always suspect to me. So. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs>